Thanks for tuning in to our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. If you have any questions or want a little bit more info on anything going on here at Coastal, check out our website at ccoceancity.com. Today, Matthew will be continuing a series on worship that we call Worship Fact. Worship frequently asks questions. Why do some raise their arms, clap their hands, or bow their knee during worship? Well, I would say that the body's position reveals the heart's condition. Take clapping our hands, for instance. We readily do so at concerts or sporting events to show approval, excitement, or even expectation. Yet for some reason, it is much harder to get someone to clap their hands in church than it is to get them to clap their hands at a sports banquet. Similarly with clapping our hands comes the hesitance to raise our hands in church. Many view the raising of hands with discomfort, yet the Bible is clear when it says, Thus I will bless you while I live, I will lift up my hands in your name. So whether we realize it or not, our body's posture is never neutral, and that is because we were hardwired to worship. With that being noted, here's another question. What type of worshipers is the Father seeking? Well, let us take a look in the scriptures to discover this answer. Good morning, church. My name is Matthew Mayer. Honored to be here. Of course, we're going to take a look, a detailed look into the scriptures about what the Father says on worship. Worship, of course, as it was defined last weekend, the foundation was laid. Pastor Matt labored to deliver the word about worship. He defined it. Of course, the Anglo-Saxon meaning behind the English word worship, the weight of God, the value of God. How valuable is God to you? Of course, a lifestyle of worship shows him his value in our priorities. That's clear. So I actually labored myself. Part two, frequently asked questions, what is the proper posture in the building, beyond the building? The proper posture, of course, is always going to deal with the heart. This is the hub of worship. So I tried to find the most appropriate quote. How do you start a message like this without finding the most profound quote that you possibly can find on worship, and I found it perfectly in the words of one of my favorite old preachers, Matt Stokes. <laughs> my main man, Matt Mayer, rap extraordinaire, <laughs> teaching past air. <laughs> and that's why our lead pastor needs prayer. And with that, I'm in. No, in, in all seriousness, church, I am stoked to be here. <laughs> now, let's get serious. As he started last week, I want to piggyback his thoughts. And he said that if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have curiosity about the message, that you can email him. So that I'm going to say the same thing. You can email him if you have any questions after this message again. <laughs> I am on a roll. Let's pray. Lord, prepare our hearts. Open our hearts to receive your word. Father, open your word that our hearts may understand. We thank you that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. For your glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So effective worship begins with a hunger for God, an appetite for God. Effective worship requires the spiritual stomach to crave God. Worship is a preoccupation with God, thinking on Him, meditating upon Him, His promises, His grace, His glory, His grandeur, everything about Him. That's the preoccupation of the weight of God. Paul would pen to the church at Philippi, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word worthy is related to the word worship in a way, oxios, as Matt defined it last week, which means wait. Only let your life weigh as much as the gospel. How much 
does the gospel weigh in your life? That his righteousness wrapped around our wretchedness. And then he declares us holy as he is. That's weight. That's heavy. That should actually move me. And I am convinced the church landscape today, we come into a building on any given Sunday and we have a hard time engaging in worship. You want to know why? We don't have an appetite for God because we've already filled up with the fluff of the world. We come in full of self. So it's hard, of course, as we just sang, rid me of myself. So I have a desire for you. My wife calls me and says, I prepared your favorite meal, Matt. Steak and potato. I'm excited. I am craving that meal. But on the way, I pass the golden arches of McDonald's. <laughs> and I stop and I get a milkshake. And of course, by the time I get home, the meal is presented before me. It's my favorite meal, yet I don't have an appetite for it because I've already filled up with empty nourishment, empty calories. And I believe sometimes we get so full of the world that we come in and we can't engage with the word. A lot of people say, I didn't get anything out of worship today. Well, worship isn't something you get out of. It's something you give. You walk by me at the door and you say, you didn't like the song choices? I'll say to you, I'm glad because we weren't singing for you. We are singing for him. We are clapping for him. We are engaging in posture for him. There are three types of worship. There is idol worship, I-D-L-E. Idol worship is when you create something in substitution of the one true God. It could be a relationship. That's good. Yet it can become an idol because you're worshiping the relationship. It could be an occupation, a job. It becomes an idol. It could be a material possession. It could be social media. It is an idol to me. It's substituting God. Satisfaction comes from God alone. That's why I'll never fill the hole in my soul. Then there's idol worship. And you're like, you just said that. No, I-D-L-E worship. It's when we go through the motion spiritually. We're idle. We're inactive. We're apathetic. We're unmoved. We're idle, yet we're still worshiping. We're worshiping self. We're worshiping depression. We're worshiping doubt. We're worshiping distractions. We're worshiping idly. Then there's ideal worship. I-D-E-A-L. Ideal worship is spirit and truth. That is going to be the foundation, the spirit and truth of worship. Here's a most beautiful psalm, Psalm 29.2. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Give unto the Lord what he deserves. Glory. And then it says, worship the Lord. There's that word, in the beauty of holiness. The word holiness means wholeness. In other words, God is complete. He's perfect. There are no fractures. As Pastor Matt said, we can constantly exaggerate our God. He's so large and so big. We'll never be able to comprehend his size, his mass, his grandeur. He's huge. And I'm to worship him as such. And when I make him bigger, self becomes smaller, sin becomes smaller, the things of my day become smaller. John would say, I just want to decrease so that you can increase. Making God larger, having a hunger, a desire, thirsting for the Lord. John chapter 4, here's the engagement, here's the interaction. Of course, Jesus, wearied from his journey, the Bible declares. He sits at a well, sends his disciples into the nearby town to get food. Here comes a woman from Samaria. She's coming, it says, in broad daylight, and we discover that she's trying to hide in broad daylight. How do you hide in broad daylight? The blistering hot sun, nobody went to the well to get water because of the heat, yet here she comes because she does not want to be seen. And we're going to discover, as Jesus uncovers, the reason why she wants to hide. Her shame had reached a climax that she did not want to be seen by anybody in her community. It's a divine appointment. It's beautiful. She's coming to draw water. Jesus is waiting to draw her. Because this is an important part of worship, how God woos us to himself, shows us how beautiful he is, how perfect he is, how glorious he is, how gracious he is, how merciful he is. He woos us to himself. He cannot change. Yet even though we come with the ugliness of our sin, he maintains the beauty of his holiness. 
And what happens is when I get so close to him and I actually take my guard down, I surrender, I am engulfed by that glory. I become like that which I worship. So here's the conversation. Jesus says to her, woman, give me a drink. Woman's a term of endearment. She says, how are you a Jew speaking to me, a Samaritan? Of course, she is stressing the racial tension that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. Jesus says, if you knew who I was that spoke to you, you would have asked me for a drink, and I would have given you living water. In other words, you would never have to come back to this physical well because I will fill you up with the spiritual living water. She says, I want that type of water. Jesus says, go get your husband and come back. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're absolutely correct. You don't have one. You've had five. And the one you know now is not your husband. Now, we say, wow, how wildly, how radically Jesus deals with her. He goes right at her. Why? Many say, well, of course, he's dealing with her harshly because the hostility would change. No, he's dealing with her in such a way because he's bringing her shame to the surface, not to demoralize, but to sanitize. You see, often God will put his hand of mercy and favor on a nerve in our life, and it hurts I don't want to deal with that, Lord, but he's not doing it to hurt us. He's doing it to heal us. I've said it before. Without conviction, there's no conversion. Without experiencing, Pastor Matt said, the weight of your sin, you'll never experience the weight of God's grace. She does what we do. She changes the subject. She said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. There's no other way you would know that about me. My present shame. Then she says, my father, our fathers, our fathers say that we're to worship on that mountain. And you Jews say you're to worship in Jerusalem. In other words, she presents this theological debate that was going on. Where's the proper place of worship? Jesus says, the hour is coming that you won't worship on a mountain over there. We won't worship in Jerusalem over there. In fact, the hour is coming and the hour is now. We're the true worshipers. We'll worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Remember that. The Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You understand how He responded to her. She says it's about a location. Jesus says, no, it's not. It's about a devotion. It's about spirit and truth. Now, the proper understanding of spirit and truth is so important. This is the recipe to the fullness of worship. The fullness of worship requires both spirit and truth. As Pastor Matt taught last week, God is spirit. We engage God because we are spiritual beings. We connect with him because it's our spirit, his spirit within us that allows us to connect with him. But the truth part of it needs to be properly presented as it's prescribed in the scriptures. So you have the Holy Spirit within us, the Holy Scriptures in front of us, and that's the perfect blend of worship. What does the Bible say about worship? Not what, as she said, and we reason, not what our Father said. Isn't that what she said? Our Father say. And Jesus says, my Father said. You know, people come to church. Now, again, we all come from different backgrounds, different upbringings, different religious experiences, different denominations. I get that. And a lot of times, all that is is passed down ritualistically and religiously from parent to child, then parent to child, then parent to child. Pastor Matt said it on stage one time, being a former Catholic. Why are you Catholic? Well, my parents are Catholic. Well, why are they Catholic? Well, their parents were Catholic. In other words, my father said, and then we got to step back and say, what does the father say? I digress because the father is seeking such. The father is seeking. You may have come in through a foggy experience. You are going through a trial, a tragedy. And in the midst of that, and I've been there, it's hard to see beyond the situation. It boxes you in. You say, like I've said, where are you, God? Where are you in this? We worry and we wonder where are you, God? And I want to encourage you, church, 
don't worry, don't wonder, just worship. Because according to the scriptures, you don't have to know where he is. You start worshiping and he'll find you. He will seek you out when you worship in spirit and in truth. Now let's go there. Two camps today, by and large. Coastal Christian, we want to find the balance between the two camps. One camp is the spirit-led camp, the spirit-filled camp. That spirit-filled camp, they are emotional. Sometimes, and I've been in those services in the past, it's emotional upheaval. It is actual spiritual frenzy, a lot of activity. I've seen people doing cartwheels down the side aisles. I've seen people swinging from the rafters. Yeah. I've heard people speaking in different tongues. Now, the Bible presents tongues spiritually. It's a spiritual gift. You have to read very slowly through 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I would love to have the time to teach on it. It's very straightforward. The Apostle Paul writes very explicitly about if you have a desire for spiritual gifts, that's great. But the greater part of your zeal should be for the edification of the church. Because I've had people come up to me and say, have you ever been baptized in the Spirit? I think so. Like slain is the word. Slain in the Spirit. So let me look that word up in the Bible concordance. Oh, it's not there. Let me look it up according to the dictionary. Slain. To kill violently. To destroy. To extinguish. No, nope, never been slain in the spirit. Because they said, if I have not been slain in the spirit and I don't start speaking in tongues, then I might not be saved. Or I might not have experienced the fullness of God. Tongues. I'm pretty sure God's using the one tongue he gave me to edify the church. Now, I'm not talking or poking fun. I'm poking holes. We get so caught up in movements and denominations, we don't ever stop to say, what do the scriptures say about that? What's the proper presentation? I've seen proper use of spiritual gifts, but the moment it's abused, that's when the church has a responsibility spiritually to teach the people the spiritual movement lacks truth. Then you got the camp that's called, they major on truth, doctrine. They are the theologians. God forbid that you move a muscle in that type of environment. God forbid that you sing too loud, that you wave your arms or hands, clap them. The truth-centered, of course, we are truth-centered here at Coastal. We go into the scriptures directly. What does God have to say about this? Now, the problem with the truth-centered culture that lacks the spirit is they major on theology and they lack personal intimacy. They so heavily talk about God's mind that they completely miss his heart. They're the ones that said to Jesus, you can't heal on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to work. He said, really? Which one of you has an oxen that falls into the ditch and doesn't save it? You see, he was honoring the spirit of the law, which is the fruit of the spirit, which is love. Spirit and truth need to find a proper balance in Christ. Now, what I'm talking about is worshiping Jesus, not worshiping a spiritual experience, not worshiping worship, not worshiping the Bible. It's worshiping the author of the Bible. Huge difference. Spirit and truth. Here's the point. Without spirit, we are not connecting with God. And without truth, we are not properly reflecting God. The both, spirit and truth, balanced. Now, when Jesus was on earth, of course, the temple was the hub of worship. It was the center of religion. People from all over the world would travel to Jerusalem to engage in worship in a physical temple. That's where they actually gather to do sacrifices. It is a place of sacrifice. The temple is a place of praise. The temple is a place of prayer. The people would come to experience God in the temple. And then Jesus came as the temple and he laid down his life. And the Bible instructs that he tore down the partition or the veil or the wall that separated sinners from his holy father. And when he did that, he gave us access as our high priest to bring us into the presence of God to worship forever. It's amazing. How? 
But when I receive him, he deposits his spirit within me. And Paul would write to the church at Corinth that we become the temple. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the place where the temple was that engaged in worship is now the church. It is now the believers, now the individual. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means my heart is to engage God in worship. What you just saw, Pete and the worship team, they weren't worshiping with their music. It wasn't about the platform. Worship was coming from their hearts. This is where praise comes from, the heart. This is where prayer comes from, the heart. This is where sacrifice comes from, the heart. Worship needs to be produced from the heart. No matter how you worship, the body is never neutral. You can worship sitting down in your seat, engaged. You could worship standing up. You could worship clapping. We're going to talk about it. You could worship with your hands raised. We're going to talk about it. You could worship with your knees bowed. We are going to talk about it. You can worship with your tongue as you sing. We're going to talk about it. But the point is this. The body is never neutral. We know that. Not only is the body never neutral, our body position reveals our heart's condition. What do you mean? Your body posture is actually putting out a message. If you've ever gone into an interview and you want the job, your posture in the seat speaks volumes. You're attentive, you're engaged. You answer the questions, you look them in the eye. Your posture is telling that person you are interested, you care, or vice versa. You come in, you slouch in the seat, you kind of look every other way except at the interviewee, and you're not engaged. Your posture is saying you don't care. Now, if you've ever been in court, Doubtful that most of you have, I have. And you stand before a judge, you call him your honor, your honor. Your posture, how you stand before him is actually telling him whether or not you're remorseful or whether or not you don't care. And I've seen both. I've seen people go into that same setting with such arrogance that they don't care that they're there. And you can see it, they got their arms crossed. Their posture is telling the judge, the honor, how they feel about this scenario. So what I'm saying is our posture, church, is speaking, whether we're worshiping God or worshiping self, because the body will never be neutral. And here's the reciprocal influence. Our outward posture will actually begin to shape our heart's temperature. What do you mean? The more I come into church and I'm so used to the service flow, I am so used to three songs up front, they break for a meet and greet, Pastor comes out, leads us in offering, a video comes on, and then here comes the message. And while they're doing that final song, as everybody's standing, I am going to sneak out. <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> so today, at the end of this message, we're going to be doing two songs. <laughs> so you can leave now. <laughs> but the reason we're doing two songs it's because the songs are going to deal with posture. It's an opportunity for us to put into practice what is being preached. We want to be a church that practices what we preach. The definition of worship now is going to lead to the demonstration of worship. Again, it's all about the heart. Now, you don't have to raise your arms. You don't have to bow your knee. But I spoke to so many people after first service and last night that walked by me and said, I raised my arms for the first time in my life. Yeah. And they said, I felt like it set me free. I'm just saying, there's something about our body engaging that loosens up something in our heart. The Bible instructs it. The Bible kind of implores us to worship. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God, David wrote, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You could see brokenness. When I was growing up, I grew up in the church, and I would see people, usually in the front rows, worshiping, hands up, singing, tears coming out, and I would watch, and I would say, that's weird. <laughs> I didn't understand it. I couldn't figure out how they were engaging in such worship. To me, it, it was foreign. I didn't know the language until I got broken myself. And brokenness can be seen in your posture. And that all made sense. Those individuals that were praising so beautifully, hands raised unashamed, singing the songs under control, decently and in order, the Bible instructs. It was because they were broken. You know, a lot of people will say, well, it's not my disposition, Matt. And I get that. It's not my disposition either. But sometimes the disposition 
needs to be broken. Woman in Luke chapter 7. This woman is not to be mistaken with Mary, who comes into the same type of worship that this woman does at the end of each gospel. This is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. She is actually anointing Jesus for his burial. But this woman in Luke 7 is not that Mary. This woman is unnamed. This woman it has no record of a single word spoken. In the account, you read it, you don't know anything about her except for her occupation. She doesn't say a word. Yet her body language, her posture speaks volumes to this very day. Here's how it happens. Jesus is invited back to a Pharisee's house. His name was Simon. So here they're all gathered around a fellowship table. Jesus is there. He's the, he's the guest of honor. And a woman gets in. First of all, she's probably where she's not supposed to be, which is uncomfortable. But there's something about worship where you have to put aside who you think you are and step into who God says you are. Worship is costly. It then says she begins to cry brokenness. Her tears are hitting his feet, which tells me she has to get low enough in a position, a posture, where she's at his feet. She then begins to dry his feet with her hair. According to her occupation as a prostitute, her hair would have been used to provoke a man. Now she's using her hair to worship the Savior. She then takes an alabaster flask with an expensive container that held an expensive fragrance or perfume. Most likely those type of alabaster flask and perfumes were kept by a woman for her dowry. She would give it as a gift to her future husband. Yet she's breaking this costly ointment and anointing Jesus. Worship is beautiful, even in fragrance. The most amazing part about that account is the very fragrance that she's putting on Jesus gets on her too. In fact, it begins to fill the house. And you know who had a problem with that? The religious folk. They always got a problem. And they start murmuring. And they don't say it out loud, but Jesus hears everything. And they say, if he was a prophet, he would knew, know what type of woman this is. Jesus turns and says, Simon... I have something to say to you. He tells this parable about people owing money and the one that had a debt that was cleared out was a great amount. That person that was forgiven much, don't they love much? Doesn't the person that realizes they've been forgiven much love much? Don't we all realize in this room we've all been forgiven much? Which should lead to us loving much? He says to them, hey, I came in your house, man. You didn't greet me with a kiss. She's not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't wash my feet. She washed my feet with her tears. You didn't anoint my head as the guest of honor. She anointed my feet. Do you understand? Worship is costly. Worship requires us to step out of our own self-image, our own reputation, because nothing matters in the moment of worship except the worthiness of God. The internal reality is seen in the external chemistry. This very chemistry is working against your heart as well. It's, it's shaping your heart. Again, we come into church week after week, and we can be so steady and so stiff. And I'm telling you, the more we get used to a service flow, I know exactly what the preacher's going to say when he says, literally, and with that, I'm in. And when the other crazy preacher says, and since we're not dead, we're not done, that's my cue to shut down. And I'm saying your body's now shaping your heart. And that word is complacency. Here's the first verse, Psalm 34, 1. I will extol the Lord at all times. The word extol means to enthusiastically praise. The word enthusiasm means full of God. I am full of God, therefore I will praise him. Here's the next part. His praise will always be on my lips. Fact. Praise can only be on one's lips if praise is in the heart. Come into church. Don't feel like singing. I've been there. My personal struggles, I have to come in. Sometimes I have to get on stage. But here's the point. The plow of praise often breaks up the hardness of heart. The moment you start singing, something begins to happen in the soil of your heart. And even if you can't sing, as Pastor Matt said last week, we still encourage you to sing because you'll be just like Brother Jones. You know Brother Jones, right? Brother Jones joins the choir, and Brother Jones can't sing. So the choir went to the lead pastor and said, 
Brother Jones can't sing. If you don't get rid of him, Pastor, you're losing us. So he said, I got a problem. He went to Brother Jones and said, Brother Jones, I heard you can't sing. You got to leave the choir. Brother Jones said, really? There's people in this church saying you can't preach and you're still here. <laughs> What's the point? You keep singing, I'll keep preaching. <laughs> All right, I got to go quick. We got caught up too much in the intro, got to go quick. Why we sing in here, it helps us gain confidence to speak of Jesus out there. Conversely, if I can't sing in the midst of fellow believers in here, do not try to convince me that you're talking about him out there. If you can't do it in here, you are not doing it out there. I say that to the students all the time. Me and my wife used to travel in student ministry. I'd get to speak at all the conferences, all the camps, and we would get to kind of witness the student activity. And of course, they would have an MC come up on stage and get the kids all hyped up and get them all excited. And he'd, I need some volunteers. And you get kids jumping up. They're coming up on stage. All right, I need you to do these certain dances. The DJ's playing music, and they're doing what's called the wobble. You ever heard of the wobble? They're doing the, the, the whip, the nay nay, the, the twerk. They're doing the juju on that beat. Get this. They're doing the stanky leg. What the heck is the stanky leg? And listen, listen. They're, they're dropping it like it's hot. They're doing all types of in beat to a certain dance that they must have watched on YouTube to learn. There's no other way to do that. And it's, 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 it, you're like, wow, this is crazy. And then they go into worship. And those same students. Something's off. Where does that come from? I know all those dances. I know all the songs. I know all the moves. But the moment that I'm engaging in God and worship, a holy and worthy God, my body goes... It's funny, right, adults? Fly, eagles, fly. <laughs> On the road to victory. <laughs> Please hear me. I'm not trying to take the fun out of recreation. But I'm saying, why don't we have the same enthusiasm when it comes to salvation? That's all I'm saying. Because if I walked up to you on the street and you're wearing the same Christian jersey as me, and I say to you, fly, Jesus, fly, on the road to Calvary, S-A-V-I-O-R, Savior. <laughs> you know what's going to happen? People are going to stop and go, that's weird. <laughs> but when the other chant goes down, when the other form of worship happens, people go, Eagles fans. And I say, really? That's cool for the Eagles of Philadelphia, but what about the Lion of Judah? Woo. Now let's clap, because Psalms 47.1 instructs, oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. What does clapping signify? Clapping signifies approval. Clapping signifies adoration, excitement, anticipation. Clapping signifies engagement. You can go to a concert, you can see a musician, a celebrity, whoever's about to come out and do something, before they even say a word or play an instrument, people are already clapping. At a ball game, the anticipation, the slow clap begins, right? That is signifying, I'm engaged. When we clap, as the word instructs, we're just saying, we approve. We are engaged. Now, those of you who do not have any type of rhythm within you, and you clap and throw everybody off, <laughs> do what I do. I clap to myself just because I feel the beat in my heart. But it helps me engage. See, clapping is a physical activity that helps spark an emotional connectivity. Because sometimes when I come again, it's like I, I, I'm, I'm struggling today. But the moment I start physically clapping, it helps spur on an emotional and spiritual connectivity. The posture of clapping, of course, is a simple way for the body to inspire the soul. Let's move on. Here come the heavier matters of worship posture. Thus, I will Bless you while I live, Psalm 63, 4. I will lift up my hands in your name. What are the hands? Pastor Matt is going to teach next weekend on some of the Hebrew definitions of, of worship. One is yada. The word yad is the Hebrew word for hands. When attached with yada, it's 
worshipful hands. You can't give God anything. You come to God with gifts. He can't, he doesn't want our gifts. But the moment I come to him with open hands, this is a sacrifice to God, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Parents, when a child comes running up to you with their hands out, what are they saying to you? Pick me up. Sometimes it's because they want to feel your presence. Sometimes they want to feel your protection. Nonetheless, when they throw their hands out as a child, mother and father hold. And I'm saying sometimes I just need my father in heaven to hold me because this day has dropped out from under me. And I raise my hands and I don't care who sees me. Of course, this means also surrender. The position of somebody who's in surrender. I've been in this position. From this experience in prison as an inmate and an officer saying, get against the wall, instantly against the wall with hands in the air, just like this. And they're patting you down. And here I am, raised a Christian, never raised my hands to a holy God. And here I am in prison, raising my hands in surrender to a man. For me, what hit me was how prideful and how foolish was I that I couldn't raise my hands to a holy God. I couldn't surrender to God? And this officer has me surrendered to him? How else? Concerts, ball games, we've been there. And the excitement with raising our hands and, and waving it and, and cheering. And, and we've got caught up in that frenzy. And that's fine. Again, I say, I'm not trying to take the fun out of it, but I'm saying it's out of balance when we come to church and we are so stiff. Spirit and truth. Your kids are trying to get your attention and you're saying, be quiet. I'm watching for the wave. The wave's coming. And here comes the wave because all you want to do is throw your hands in the air. So why don't we do the wave for the first time in church history? <laughs> You ever, seen, you ever seen Ricky Bobby in Talladega Nights <laughs> when he's doing the interview? That's what some of you guys look like with your hands. You don't know what to do with your hands. In the interview, he's like this. Now listen, you might have brought a friend to church today, and they might afterwards say to you, dude, Talladega Nights, your pastor's a heathen. <laughs> and you have full permission to say to them, no, sir, he is not a pastor. He is our pastor on parole. <laughs> Psalm 95, 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Again, this is from the same vein in the same experience, yet a different scenario. I lived with 37 other men. Your bunk bed was your room. Well, each day I would put all my books at the foot of my bunk bed all of my books would stack up and I would put my word processor, which cut my bed in half, literally. Now there was a certain group in the DOC called the SOG, Special Operations Group. When they came in, they were coming in for one purpose only, to get you to submit to their will. And their will was to wreak havoc and destruction on a housing unit, to flip it upside down to find contraband. Now when that happened, you don't have time because you have to get on your bed instantly. You don't have time to say, I gotta move my books so I can lay out flat. No, I'd have to get at the front of my bed, literally, with my face tucked into my pillow, because that was the command, with my feet folded behind my back, because that was the command. And here I am, submitted on my knees to the will of a man who wants to do me harm. And I can't submit to the will of a father who wants to do me good? It might not be in the sanctuary, it could be in your bedroom, on your bed, kneeling. But something happens in your heart when the body and the posture bows. This also symbolizes to a king honor. You come into the king's presence, you kneel. It also signifies desperation. You would plea. The word in Greek for worship is proskuneo. The imagery that comes with it, worship, is a dog lapping or licking the hand of a master. That's worship. We bow our knee. Here's the point. The world that we live in will get you to bow to it figuratively. Many of us are bowing right now to debt, bowing to opinion. Young ones, bowing to peer pressure. I'm bound to what you think of me, so my life is going to actually follow the fear of you as opposed to the fear of him. Many of us are bowing to our jobs, bowing to various things figuratively. There are even instances where our lives will bow forcefully to the world. After a long night out drinking or drugging, now you're bowed at a toilet, forcefully. 
There's nothing you can do about it. You are bound. Tragedy may strike and it brings you to your knees physically. And I'm saying, we serve a God who allows us to bow to him willfully. However, one day, the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I'm saying, yeah. So I am saying, why not that someday be today? If that's going to happen forcefully one day, why not let that happen today willfully? Yeah. Bowing the knee. In the last night's service, this morning's service, I watched people turn their chairs into an altar. They just bowed at their chair. Between them and God, there was communion. It was beautiful. I watched people just bow their bodies over. I watched people raise their arms. I watched people, but brokenness can be seen. The two songs at the end are going to engage us in those postures. And I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you at the same time. The posture. Because the point of posture is without the posture of the heart being bent toward Jesus, nothing you do will ever have purpose. Nothing. So no matter how hard you clap, no matter how loud you sing, no matter how high you raise your arms and swing, if Jesus is not at the center, all that's nothing but theater. So what is worship? The world calls a nine-to-five work. You may be a stay-at-home mom. The kids are putting you to the test, and you say, this is such hard work. You may be a social worker, a teacher, a lawyer, a judge. You may be in ministry. And the world calls all those activities work. Yet, the believer can call all of those same activities worship. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Therefore, whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, do it for God's glory. Do you understand the believer can give God glory in even the most mundane task? Even mundane work can become a mountain of worship when connected with the one true God in fellowship, in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship Him, whether by clapping your hands, raising your arms, singing the songs, bowing the knee. Because since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless. As a church, we believe it's our job to connect our community to Christ. So if the message today impacted you in any way, we'd like to invite you to take part in our mission and share this message with family and friends. We'll see you next week.